Hello, everybody. We are live <laughs> for NVT at Home Founders Month edition. I am your host moderator, Chelsea D. I'm here with a cohort of alumni who are just blazing trails into the new into the new world, into the future. Um, and so I'm so excited to be talking to everybody here this evening. Um, but before we get into this, I wanna take a moment to talk about what we're doing here for Founders Month um, and why the significance of, of what, this, what this year really means. Um, thinking about 50 years since the beginning of the National Black Theater and, and what does the next 50 years look like? What does that, what is that gonna entail? How are we gonna get there? So part of how we're figuring that out is through these conversations for myself personally and spiritually and artistically, I've been figuring out, well, what does the future look like? How can we really plot out a map incorporating all of our, um, all of our insight? Um, but then also thinking from a, an infrastructure place, how do we do this? So MBT has launched the Vision Forward Fund. Okay? And this fund is gonna help ground fortify and help MBT imagine yet another 50 years. So these principles of grounding, fortifying and imagining, those are the reasons why we are starting this fund so we can figure out how we can sustain ourselves for the next 50 years. We wanna start an archive so that we can really preserve the legacy of Dr. Tear and the technology of soul and just all of the things that have been created over the course of MBT's 50 years. Um, we're figuring out how we can build capacity so that artists like who we're talking to today can have even more support, even more resources, even more access um, through this fund. And how are we imagining, how are we imagining the future for MBT? So check out MBT's website, Facebook page. There's a little button that says donate, and that will go to the Vision Forward Fund. So that's what, uh, that's a part of what we're talking about today. Um, but more, more to the point, I would like to introduce the folks who are on this call. We were talking before we went live and there was just so much like, ah, just so much goodness, such a reminder of like, why, why we're doing this? Who, who is this for? I'm circling back to that and that's an, in, that's an inside joke that I'm now making outside. Um, <laughs> But really, really so wonderful to be in, in communion with you all. And I'm gonna do some introductions. Uh, starting off with Umfaniso Yudofia, a first generation Nigerian American storyteller and educator, attended Wellesley College, obtained her MFA from the American Conservatory Theater. And while at ACT, co-pioneered the NIA project, which provided artistic outlets for youth residing in Bayview slash Hunts Point. Productions of her plays Sojourners, Run Boy Run, Her Portmanteau, and In Old Age have been seen at the American Conservatory Theater, the New York Theater Workshop, the Playwrights Realm, Magic Theater, National Black Theater, Strand Theater Company, and Boston Court. She's the recipient of the 2017 Helen Merrill Playwright Award, the 2017-18 McKnight National Residency, and commission at the Playwright Center and is a member of the New Dramatists. She's also worked as a television writer on 13 Reasons Why, Little America, and Pachinko. Mfaniso, welcome back. Hey. <laughs> that was a strong read of my bio. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and that's what's happening right now. It's so good to see you. Thank you, I'm very good to see you. Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna move on. And yes, everybody will be getting a strong reading <laughs> rendition of their bio. So just buckle up, okay? Just buckle up. Okay, moving on to Ngozi Anyanwu. Um, she was educated at the University of California, San Diego, MFA in acting, Point Park University, BA. Playwriting, she wrote Good Grief, The Homecoming Queen, the Book of Lucy and Nike, or We Don't Need Another Hero, 
Good Grief was on the Kilroy's list in 2016, a semifinalist for the Princess Grace and Humanitas Award. It was also produced at Center Theater Group in Los Angeles in spring 2017, which Anyan Wu also starred in, as well as Off-Broadway in the fall of 2018 at the Vineyard Theater. Anyan Wu has, has also received residencies and is also commissioned with NYU, The Old Globe, and the Atlantic Theater, Ngazi. What's good? How are you? Hey, everybody. That was a strong read. I like the strong. finger. <laughs> and started. I appreciate it. I'm good. Hanging out here in LA. Great. If I'm looking down, it's because I'm also dog sitting, not because I'm on my phone. So I'm also dog sitting. So if you see me, it's like me trying to calm down a dog. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the update. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Okay, Lee Edward Colston the second. Welcome, welcome. Here we go. Lee Edward is a queer Philly native, former prison guard and MMA fighter turned actor, television writer, playwright, director, acting teacher and author. In 2019, Lee's critically acclaimed play, The First Deep Breath, opened to rave reviews at Victory Gardens Theater in Chicago, as well as being a semifinalist for the Page 73 Playwriting Fellowship and a finalist for Barrington Stage Company's Berman New Play Award, as well as being the 2020 recipient of the Steinberg New Play Award citation. Television writing credits include season four of Fargo on FX and Four Life on ABC. Lee Edward, what's happening? <laughs> what's good? Just happy to be here. That was a very strong read. Thank you very much. <laughs> Consistency. Okay. That's what we're going for. We love to see it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Moving on. Angelica Sherry is a playwright, musical theater book writer, lyricist, screenwriter, and poet. The plays of her Prophet Cycle trilogy include The Seeds of Abraham, Billie Holiday Theater, mentored by Lynn Nottage, The Sting of White Roses, National Black Theater Festival, and Crowndation, National Black Theater, I Am Soul Residency. Angelica and her collaborator, Ross Baum, is that, is that it, Baum? Okay, Ross Baum received the Richard Rogers Award for their musical Gun and Powder which had its world premiere at Signature Theater directed by Robert O'Hara. She was the master playwright in the Frank Silvera Work Writers Workshop inaugural three and three playwright festival and has written for the Obie award-winning 48 hours in Harlem festival and the fire this time festival. Angelica, how do you do? Amen, Ashe. <laughs> yes to all the commas and the capital letters in the bio. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you gotta honor that. You gotta honor the text. I am well. I'm in LA and I'm staying away from COVID and Amen. living my best life in this quarantine. <laughs> Ooh. And staying hydrated. Y'all yes. y'all may not be able to see it, but off camera. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, moving on. Dominic Ryder is a director and dramaturg based in Brooklyn, New York. They believe in living and loving like it is the end of the world. Agreed. Amen. Dominic's work seeks to answer the question, what is a world unmade by slavery? They worked as a director, assistant, and collaborator at Ensemble Studio Theater, the Haiti Cultural Exchange, MCC, the Old Globe, the Lark, Soho Rep, the Atlantic, the Bushwick Star, Club Thub, Long Wharf, Flux Theater Company, Theater Ensemble, WP, The Movement Theater Company, and The Black Lady Theater. They are the director in residence for the National Black Theater through 2021. Dominic, welcome. Thank you so much. It's Dominique. <laughs> Dominique, great. Good, good, good. Dominique, Dominique, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, how are you doing? You doing okay? You doing all right? Okay. Jesus, yeah. I'm doing great. We out here in these fabulous streets. It's just me and some Haitians, you know, gang. Gang, ah. <laughs> gang, 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 okay? I'm with it, Dominique, I'm with it. All right, so today, for today's show, we're talking about what fueled Dr. Tier to create NBT, which is uh, just kind of a bigger, larger conversation we're having for the next 
three weeks, four weeks. Oh, okay. July 16th is the last conversation. So the rest of this month, we're, we're going to be getting into this. Um, and the question we're asking today is what does it mean to create radically free spaces? Um, do we still need these spaces? And how do we create, how do we sustain what we create? Uh, for today's check-in questions for the artists, uh, and just to give everybody a heads up, we'll start with Angelica. Um, but to give you a heads up for the, what those check-in questions are, we're doing an, an accessibility check-in. Are your needs being met? And accessibility is referencing physical, emotional, psychological. What do we need to do for you as a community to make you feel most present? So accessibility check-in. Um, give us some project updates or something creative that you're working on that you want folks to know about. Um, and then the last question is, which residency did you participate in at NBT? And how has working with NBT changed or affected your approach to art making? Uh, and we'll start off with Angelica. Okay, here we go. So the first part of this is um, the accessibility check-in, right? So for myself, I am feeling very abundantly supplied, thankfully. Um, and I feel as though in this moment, what's really been wonderful is the outreach that's been happening by the community. I feel like there's just been so many check-ins saying like, sis, are you good? Do you have what you need? Where do you wanna fit into this conversation, right? Cause we've been having lots of conversation about with everything that's been happening with George Floyd, with Breonna Taylor, with Ahmaud Arbery and with the litany of other black bodies slain and justly talking about what our position is and how we are moving forward and taking control of our space. And so I've been feeling really empowered by just seeing the mobilization of specific pockets happening, even within our own black theater community, right? Like there's like a Venn diagram of different people galvanizing. And so that's been really, really fulfilling. So just to be a part of that, to see those circles kind of like convert, converging together and to just be a part of all these conversations has been fueling me. Um, and then I also do a healthy amount of going down into my rabbit hole and staying out of everything and to be able to create because I feel like if I start my day with everyone else's thoughts, then I can't hear my own. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's been a healthy balance as healthy as it, you know, it's a work in progress, but like a healthy ish balance of absorbing, staying up to date and then going away, doing what I have to do and, and creating in a safe, unfiltered space. So all that to say, I feel pretty checked in and feel pretty supplied in a good way. Yes. And so what's the next thing? <laughs> <laughs> any any creative projects or updates that you have for folks? Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so most recently, so Gun and Powder, the musical, which is about the legacy of my great great aunties who passed for white and according to legend were notorious outlaws in Texas. Um, and it's just been really interesting to think about having that story in the front right now. I mean, we started writing that piece in 2014 when Mike Brown was killed in Ferguson. And then now in 2020, it feels even more, you know, current, but you can't even call something like that. It's just always continuous, continuously becoming more and more present in the, in our society. But um, that piece had a run that closed just before the shutdown. And we had a lab that was scheduled in New York for May. And so that's been uh, since postponed to the beginning of next year, hopefully. So that's been happening and we've been working on that. I've also just been spending a lot of time working on TV, um, a couple pilots and a couple film scripts because I just feel like it, this is the time to focus on mediums where we don't have to be in the same room to experience them. So that's been really fulfilling and a great way to kind of balance my creative palette. And then also doing some spoken word poetry over IG Live, which has been really fun and being able to share with people across the country. So that's been really dope. Um, and forgive me, love, the, the last question. <laughs> last one is, which residency were you a part right. of, which year, and how has working with MBT um, affected your art making process? Oh my goodness. That's so, a big one. That's a big one, goodness mm -hmm. gracious. So I was part of the I Am Soul Playwright Residency, and that ran from 2016 to 2018, and it culminated with the, the piece um, Crown Dation, which was 
directed by Caesar Williams and starring Sharia Irving and stage managed by beloved Belinda Hardin. And so it was just one of the things about that piece is because it's a one woman show and it's my story. And it was the most naked storytelling I've ever done. It was just like straight up truth telling like this is it. This is my business y'all. Like y'all funny just hear it. Um, the impulse was too, because it was part of a trilogy was to start writing that piece under the same guise of okay this is a family drama about these six people and you can kind of weave the truth in somehow um but it was the more I kept leaning into that the more characters kept getting cut back the more that it was just clear that it was just like it's this woman's time to just stand up here and just talk about her business and you to talk about your business and put yourself out there and so that was terrifying that was a lot of like crying and praying and drinking wine and listening to gospel music writing all of it together at the same time writing that piece but what was so helpful was just the love and the support that mbt created the safe space the the conversations the incense everything <laughs> like just being able to say girl okay burn this nag champa go get you a chicken plate and come in here and let's talk about it. And it was just like, this is how I want to be working. Thank you, I need this. I need to be able to feel like I have permission to just come up here and tell the truth. And so that was reinforced by everyone, by Jonathan, by Sade, by Alan C. Edwards, our lighting designer, by uh, Sharia, like just every single person who was present. And so I thank MBT for that. And that has stayed with me, no more filters. Wonderful, wonderful, just an affirming, honest, raw experience. Ah, beautiful. Uh, Dominique, can we check in with you now? Yes, of course you can. Okay. okay, so let us know about your accessibility and any updates or creative projects you want you want us to be mindful of. Yeah, I think um, in terms of accessibility, I'm good. I got these glasses on. Um, you know, I hate wearing glasses, but I got to see somehow. So we're here. <laughs> needs, needs are always met as long as that insurance comes through. And as for creative projects, I'm not really... Um, I'm not really working on anything right now. Um, super intentionally, I think once the shutdown hit for me, it was like, I don't need to be thinking creatively right now, right? Like, because I wanted, I wanted some time to refuse creativity. Cause I think that so often for myself, like as a director that my creativity went into the service of like capital, you know what I mean? And, and so for me, the shutdown has really been about, okay, well, one, what is a director? What does that mean? And then two, who is Dominique as a person, the artist aside, the person who needs to work aside, right? Like who is Dominique without their connection to labor? And that has been super, super useful for me in just thinking about how we need to, how I, we, you know, how I need to move forward into like the next space, right? Um, and then the next question, I think I answered the question about creativity and updates at the same time. Um, I am currently in, I am not yet an alumni. It actually feels so funny. It feels like everyone else is like a graduate student who's like moved on and is doing their things. And I'm just like, I'm still at the school. <laughs> um, so I am the directing resident uh, through 2021. And I think the biggest thing for me that MBT has done has really, MBT's existence has let me know that like white institutions don't have to be anything to me, right? That like, I have been in a place where I'm able to focus on directing i remember like I, I directed this reading and jonathan wanted to have a note session afterwards and he was like if you want to be a better director you need to be able to convey you need to be able to convey, convey emotions about having your actors talk to each other and i was like i had four hours how could i do that in four hours he was like i don't know but if you were a better director you'd be able to do it right and it's that sort of like intense rigor when thinking about what being a director is it's been really important and just the chance to think about outside of playwrights, outside of designers, like who is Dominique as a director and what is the craft of directing? Because that's not the thing you get a lot of places, most directors never have it. Um, and so to be able to get that sort of like hands-on experience like that has been very, very important to me. And then also just being able to bring in other niggas to MBT and just be like, this is also your space, right? That's also been very fulfilling. Oh man, that, I mean, it's just, it's just such a, oh uh, goodness. Uh, and I say, oh man, as a general phrase of just, I so understand this idea of this, I'm so, it's so resonating with me, this idea of disconnecting your creativity from commercial um, output and for, and for figuring out who you are, the part of you that needs to work 
um, outside of figuring out who you are. Um, and I think that's such a that's such a precious lesson to be really engaging in right now. Um, so thank you for talking about that because that's that's real. Um, Lee Edward, let's check in. How are you doing? Give us your accessibility and any any updates. Uh, I am blessed and highly melanated. Uh, and uh, yeah, as far as accessibility, uh, I mean, I would love to access some sleep because uh, my sleep cycle is all fucked up right now. Um, and I think a lot of it is like, you know, just from stress, uh, you know, of, you know, trying to survive a plague and a revolution at the same time, um, which is, you know, its own experience uh, that is specific uh, to us as Black folks. Um, <clears throat> uh, but other than that, uh, I'm my heart is good and I'm happy and I'm and I'm building uh, accessibility points for myself to really help myself to thrive. Um, as far as like projects that I'm working on, uh, I'm writing a new play right now, um, and I'm also developing a lot in television and uh, in film. Uh, so those things have been keeping the lights on, which is great. Um, it's a great time for uh, to write in television right now. Uh, and it's a doubly great time to be black and writing in television right now. Um, things could be better uh, for all of us, uh, for sure. But um, yeah, I'm trying to imagine the future right now. I'm trying to imagine like, you know, what uh, the world is gonna need uh, artistically uh, to help us to heal and to help us to move forward and to help us to organize our thoughts and our experience um, and to help us have a catharsis after this experience is done. Um, because, because, because we're gonna need that in order to be able to like to move forward. So I'm trying to imagine what that looks like in a post COVID world. Uh, post 2020 revolution world, you know? Um, and I was a playwriting resident uh, at MBT. My, I think I started in 2017 uh, and finished in uh, top of 2019. Um, and yeah, that's where I'm at. Did it impact your, your, your way of working? Absolutely, I mean, <clears throat> MBT will like, I mean, has just this uh, place in my heart that no other institution will ever have in my heart. Um, and it's, a, uh, it's one of the reasons why I will sing MBT's praises from the mountaintop, you know, now and forevermore, I'm in. Um, because it was the safest environment for me as a black creative that I've ever been in. Um, and uh, it was a place that even though like when I, when I, uh, right when I got my residency, it was, it was also around the time when I first been introduced to MBT. So it was kind of like a very new experience for me. And I walked in and I was like, oh, I'm home. I just felt it. Like I, I felt, uh, I was like, I feel completely protected and safe in here, which then uh, helped my vulnerability to expand more, which then helped me to be even more creative. Um, it's one of the things that's, uh, that's most difficult for black artists navigating white institutions is that we're trying to figure out, we're trying to do that dance of like, how do I make sure that I'm, you know, keeping my myself protected while also trying to be the most vulnerable version of myself as well um, to produce art and then to produce the things that I care about. And so that becomes like, you know, a tug of war, push pull dance sometimes and uh, during my soul residency, that was the first time I did not have to do that. And I was like, oh, this is what this feels like to not have to have that, you know, part of your brain working in the background, because it does take up space, uh, the navigating of that. Um, and some of, uh, some of that is necessary for our, our survival as human beings and our creative survival as artists. Um, and some of it is just, you know, necessary for us as black people. Um, and it's interesting, you, like you don't know how heavy something is until you put it down and you stop carrying it. And then you're able to like actually breathe. So, so yeah, I mean, my soul residency was a life-changing experience for me. Wow. 
You never know. You never know how heavy it is. And so mm-hmm. you are given space um, to release it. And that was such a big part of Dr. Tear's philosophies, healing mm-hmm. at the center of the art making. So it's glad to see that it's still, it's still active. <laughs> Okay, Ngavi, let's have a check in. Let's have a check in. Let's have a check in. I like that. <laughs> hey, hey. Um, let's see, accessibility wise, I'm in Cali, I'm in LA, I have right. running water. Uh, I'm, car- I'm currently looking for a therapist. Uh, so that's where I'm at at the moment. I'm, I'm currently seeking a therapist. So please, they're making all the money right now. If you think black TV writers are making the money, it's the hey. therapist making money because I can't find a black woman who's not overextended. God bless them. So if you know anybody, that's where I'm currently at. Um, <laughs> so um, right now, I think I'm in the place of um, I'm in the place of looking for inspiration, working on some stuff for me. Um, I'm commissioned, so I'm like in and out working on those things. I'm in the place where representation is like, do you got anything? And, and like, let's capitalize on this moment. And like, it's kind of the last thing I'm interested in. Um, and that kind of changes moment from moment, hour to hour, um, as far as do I want to make something right now? Do I want to pick something right now? And then it's like, it's two o'clock. I actually just want to go to bed slash two hours ago, I was just eating oxtail in front of all of you. Uh, so that's kind of like how it's been moment to moment. It's literally like, I don't know what I want to do. And, and then the next day I'll write a play. You know what I mean? Like, and you know, so right now I'm just mostly thinking about how I can be of service um, and just trying to extend my time to friends and go on walks and, and have some great phone calls and 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 maybe read some people's work who like usually don't have access to me because I'm usually so busy working. So right now uh, it has challenged me to be in a place of service for other people and how can I give a little bit and like take mat naps. And so most of my time right now is spent on my sister who's starting a new management company. I promise I'll give a shout out because now I'm her manager. <laughs> so I'm talking about TTIL who's starting ttalentmanagement.com. Look her up. Hit her up, send some donations. Black woman business, you know what it is. Uh, what else? Uh, which then veered into that I was the uh, first producing fellow um, that they had here at NVT. Um, John that brought me in after I had, um, with my sister and some other friends, self produced Good Grief at Intar and had also, you know, had produced, co produced First Generation Nigerian Project with Faniso and Yvonne Orji and Jennifer Akabu and others. And so, um, Jonathan had kind of, that was sort of the first institution that was really brought into to sort of see the inner workings of like how it all works. You know, I'm, I'm kind of used to doing it in the very sort of scrappy way of like, all right, I want to make this thing. What does it take to make this thing? Let's put it together. Let's cross our fingers. I'll fight people and see how it goes. And, and so he kind of brought me into a sort of institution to see. And what I learned from, from MBT was just the sort of like how to keep it holistic, you know what I mean? It, it, for me, it reaffirmed the work that I already do, which is like just about making things and bringing your community in, you know? And so by the time that I was, you know, let into white institutions or predominantly white institutions, I kind of already walked in with the mentality of like, great, but like, I need you to let me, like, I need my, like, this is my director, this is why, this is what I need you guys to do for the community so that they feel welcome to come in. And this is what I need for you to do for the artist. So for me, it was just a place that kind of fortified and gave me time to kind of um, feel powerful enough to walk into those institutions and demand what I want because this is how you make good theater Um, and to challenge that too, because there's also still some challenging times also at MBT. So for me, it was sitting in on a lot of interesting conversations about what it means to make the play for the artist. What does it mean for the art, you know, for the actors along with that journey? Even what is that, you know, I also learned about the sort of the ins and outs of like, oh, this theater is having a harder time getting a review or getting publicity than like white theaters. Do you know what I mean? And like learning about all those the intricacies of what a black, all the, yeah, what, the, what a black institution has to go through just to get like the bare minimum um, of demand. Do you know what I mean? So for me, it was like, okay, great. Like this is something to know when I'm walking into those other institutions, you know? So yeah, I learned a lot about like the ins and outs of like the game, if you will. Um, 
too. So much to be learned at that table <laughs> within that office. There's just so much yeah. learning <laughs> yes. that happens by the, by the printing machine between the bathroom and the meditation room. It's just learning. So yeah, yeah absorbing it all. And to round off our check-in, Mpaniso, what's happening? Talk about let's, let's accessibility, what do you need? What, what, are you, what are you working on? How are you, what, which residency which you, were you a part of and how's it affected you? Oh, many questions. I'm going to try <laughs> <laughs> and answer them all. Um, as for accessibility, I am in New York City. Um, I have been away from New York now. I'm gonna say almost half a year. So it's good to be in like my apartment with my pink wall that I thought long and hard about. Um, so I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, I might have to like, like dip for a second and turn off my AC and get a charger. You know, like the, the first world struggle ship problems might actually happen. So it, in terms of accessibility, if you see me go, that's why. Um, yeah, but most of all, I'm feeling pretty good and easy and in my skin and I'm very happy, um, which has been like a struggle to be that way. Uh, and it's interesting that it's happening in this time that I am figuring out what my center is when the whole world seems to be blowing apart. Um, and so, yeah, I spend most of my time like in salt baths lately, like once every other day. I'm sitting in an Epsom salt bath. Uh, I'm pretty rigorously meditating um, and I go on five mile walks. I have myself my weekly therapy meeting. I am doing some of the things that I need to do to be pretty whole because 2020 has been um, a psychological devastation. So yeah, that's, uh, yeah. That's the truth. Um, so uh, about projects and updates, I um, am standing in the center of a lot of bounty and I'm deciding not to do anything. So I have got a lot of commissions. I'm not writing on them until sometime later in July because right now I'm taking a vacation. Um, I, before I took this vacation, I was working on, um, a studio movie and working on TV and like trying to figure out a play. And I usually am always flirting with some level of exhaustion, but this time it became dangerous. And so I do nothing until I feel like doing something. And in the beginning, I wasn't okay with that, but I'm pretty good like being bored and watching. Like for some reason yesterday, I decided to watch Elf. It's a bad show, but yeah. I it's a terrible show. <laughs> but I was watching Elf and next week, y'all, I will be watching Benson. I'm just making my way through all of the TV that I grew up on and like looking at it horrified. So that's what I'm doing. At some point, I will come back to Amen and 227 and heal myself. But right now, I'm on out. Um, so those are my project updates. <laughs> um, so as for the residency that I, I did, I, did uh, I was actually the first I Am Soul playwright. I think that was 2013. You might need to correct me on it because sometimes dates in my mind are kind of fuzzy. Um, and I remember like talking with Jonathan and going, well, what do you want? And I hadn't really ever had a conversation about what do I want before? So I was like, I want some money. He was like, okay, great. So I, does this mean we have to pay you to do this? I'm like, yeah, if you could pay for like a month for me or two, I could write a play and not have to worry because I'm working gig jobs anyway. And Jonathan was like, bet, great, done. I'm like, great, let me ask for more things. <laughs> so, um, and listen, I think that theater making is tricky and I'm gonna be very honest here that where whichever institution you go, it's tricky. And I also know who I am as a person. And I am like delightfully rigorous and pleasantly difficult at different points in my life, my career, my creation. So there were moments where it's like, no, it has to be this way. But 
these are, this is what NBT can do. And I'm like, we need to have continual conversation about what my needs are as an artist and what the resources are here. Because I know you bringing me in here means you actually want to have that conversation. So I'm very thankful to NBT that I got to actually be my true, complicated, creatively pleasant and difficult self and got to manifest the show that I wanted to see, which meant like, y'all know we need to actually have because I did um her portmanteau which is one of my cycle plays that was the first time her portmanteau ever came to be was at and with National Black Theater and it was with National Black Theater that I was like okay these are the limitations of the space this is what I need as an artist we need to figure out a way for me to write this play a quarter in a BBO so that I can put my complication and who I am into the play so it was there that I actually got to see exactly who I am as an artist and just start to get comfortable with that uh, and, and be easy in the totality of myself as opposed to containing that because I am afraid. And I got to make some complicated, gorgeous work and that play has um, gone on. So, yeah. Ooh, yes, thank you. I mean, I just feel like you just gave me permission to do to do a lot of things, so that was that was wonderful. Thank you. I mean, yeah. Don't what what you know? And as you were saying earlier, like who's this for? When I feel propelled to comp compelled to do work, to say yes, to to get the draft out, to whatever. What is that? What, what what's that coming from? And 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 who am I in relationship to that? And don't make you 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 spoke to that a, as well. Of like, what am I in relationship to my art and to my work? Um, so I'm excited to really dig into that. Oh, Kelly Dokely, let me, let me peek at my screen. All right, so, uh, you know, you know, it's a production. It's a production. Um, so let's think about um, the purpose of theater, the purpose of theater. And I'm going to read a quote from um, an article that Dr. Tier wrote for the New York Times. Um, and it's from the article called Theater. And she's talking about why she felt the need to found the National Black Theater. Uh, and I wanna use that as a jumping point into, into our conversation. So Dr. Tier uh, says, she talks about how we as in Black people have allowed ourselves to be used by predominantly white institutions. Unless that is confronted, the Black artist will not see the need for a Black cultural art form, a way of working Blackly. She says the need for a black cultural art form is more pressing than solving white racism. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about this cultural black cultural art form. And there's so many identities that we're bringing into this conversation. There's so much complexity of blackness that Dr. Tier was beginning to understand. Um, and so I just wanna, wanna pose this question to the group. How do you see the need for a black cultural art form? And how would you define that? What is a black cultural art form to you? How have you seen it? How have you, have you participated in, in the making of it? Um, where do you see it? Where do you not see it? Just trying to name this thing, black cultural art form. Um, and if there's anyone in particular who feels moved to just jump on out there. I'll start. Um, I don't think that there's a, a singular uh, Black cultural art form because I think there's many ways to express, express Black culture as there are Black people. Um, I, think there, I think there's a need for us to have room to express and interpret our Blackness uh, through whatever unique lens and intersection that we sit in. Um, I feel that's important. Um, and it's something that uh, we should carve out in space. Um, we should have institutions that make room for that so that we can examine the complexity and nuances of ourselves and mind ourselves to be able to create work that, that's important to us. Thank you. Um, and I just want to also toss this out here. Um, what are some things that allow folks to feel like they can bring all of their complexities? Like, 
and we can get very nitty gritty about this. Is it rehearsal space? Is it housing? Is it, what are the things that make you feel like you can bring your most authentic self to a space? Um, and what is working blackly? What is that for you specifically? I mean, I think it's about having the confidence. And I don't know where, I, it's interesting. I'm trying to think of like where that stems from, the confidence kind of, because I think like that's whatever space, you can, you can do that whatever space you walk into, you know? Um, and as someone who doesn't get to or has not worked predominantly in Black institutions or Black spaces, as someone who's, who's, who's raised around white people, white spaces, white institutions, um, but has always felt confident walking in spaces and bringing Black people along and knowing that, oh, there's something missing here. I think there's, a, there's, there's needs to be awareness. For me, it's like, oh, there's something missing here and I'm actually not comfortable being the only one. Like I've never been comfortable being the token. I've never been comfortable being, you know, so I've always had the want and need to bring Black people or African people or, or diasporic people with me because it's just not where I feel at home. So for me, it's always been like, well, I don't quite feel at home. How do I make myself feel at home? So it's always been slightly for me self-serving because I'm like, I don't feel comfortable being the only one in this space, even though I am celebrated in this space. So that's kind of always what it's been for me. It's like, I don't feel at home if I'm by myself. With, if I'm the only black person there. I feel at home if there are other people with me and that they have the same politics of also wanting to bring other people with them. So that's that's at least, that's kind of what it means for me. It means sort of, it means something communal. And I don't know what why that is. It might be because I come from a big family and what have you. I don't love the solitary space. I'm a writer, but I, I hate the act of writing. I want to get it done so I can get to the people. <laughs> and so I can get to the human beings and then so I can share it with the human beings. Um, but for me, it's always been, at least for me, it means creating space where I can bring more black people with me. And, and I love that you're, you, when you're, when you're talking about black people, you're talking, you're, 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 you're saying, I, I want to, I'm specifically investing in and proud of and wanting to um, share my African heritage, like specifically my African heritage. But then there's also this American experience that you've <laughs> had. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about like the challenges or the tensions within like bringing lots of different black people together? Like what are the challenges within the di diaspora that you maybe have experienced? And anyone else I mean, can speak to this too, if there's, if there's I mean, thoughts. what's interesting in that is that there is also not a universal African experience, right? Like I am Nigerian and I'm Igbo, Mfani so is Ibibio. We are not, this, we are not, we work together. We are not the same person. <laughs> you know what I mean? We have had our own complications and love within us working as me being an actor in her pieces and her being an actor in my pieces, right? So like, for me, it's, it's having the knowledge that even within my very specific culture, there, it is not monolithic. Nigeria is the most populated country in Africa, the fifth most populated country in the world. And so you're going to breed different kinds of people. And so I, I, I think I got a very early understanding that, and being bicultural or tricultural, right, is that I, I had a very early understanding that I need to take people as they are. Right, and that there, and that black people have just as much of a diverse experience, you know. And so there are many things assumed about me because of because of, because of how I walked into the space, and I never wanted to assume the same thing out of someone else, right? And so for me, it's mostly the for me, it, it's literally like how do I holistically get to the person who is walking into this room and get that black person, that African person, that when, no matter what part of the diaspora that they're from, really feeling fortified as an individual so that they can walk out and feel really powerful. I want, I, I know what it is to walk into a space, be it black or be it white or be it whatever and feel like I don't belong. I, like I know what that is. And so for me, it's like, how do I get someone to walk into my space no, and, and, and see, let you see who I am, but also let you know that you belong here too. So that's, that's just something that I am, that is a mission that I'm trying to always remember pre the fancy stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
And if I can just always remember that, then it really doesn't matter who walks into the space. Then they, they know that too. You know what I mean? Yeah. I love, I love this. I love that we're talking about the holisticness that is required. And, and, and I think that's some of the brilliance that Dr. Tier brought with creating the National Black Theater is like, we have to, we as Black people have to think about our healing first and foremost and center that before we can, you know, this idea of pouring from an empty cup, right? Before we can do anything for anyone else. Um, so yeah, let's keep this conversation going. Is there anyone wants to talk about um, any challenges you've experienced going from a Black culturally specific organization into kind of a wider, maybe predominantly white organizations or productions, any challenges, any advice to folks who are feeling the tension between the two? Um, I think I'm going to tie in a little bit to what Ngozi was saying and then like flip into what you're asking. I think, I hope, um, because I really resonate with what Ngozi's saying when she's talking in and around communion and like a certain kind of like, there's no way tokenism feels like an integrated home, mm -hmm. you know? So, and I have been like, for some of my close, close friends, they know I've been reading a lot of bell hooks and I'm fascinated right now about what she talks, like when she had her definition of, integration is the anti-compartmentalization and that just just blew my world you know so um there's something about what Nguzi is talking about that gets right to that point uh and I also find because of the kind of way I like to create and what creating blackly is for me a truly safe space not only has healing and communion but also has the back end which I sometimes find really missing um which is a certain kind of accountability um and the way in which I'm just gonna I guess I'm just gonna say it like you know predominantly white institutions it takes a longer time to actually be able to figure out what accountability is uh, amidst a lot of gas. It finds, I, I, I don't, I don't know. It's like, we're, everyone is so happy to have me there that I can't even figure out what the art of what I'm trying to do is anymore. Um, and so it can feel a little like a haze if I'm not careful. So in order for me to continuously create Blackly, I have like a core group of friends who at every step of the way are reading my work. And I have like cis kid friends who will pull me aside and will be like, okay, so can we talk about this line right here? Because it actually might be this. It actually might be this, you know? And, so that I can hold myself accountable. So, cause I'm, I am not only looking for healing and communion. I'm also looking to really stretch myself and my artistry and all of that. Um, sometimes I need a delightful check within my work, you know, and I have been in enough institutions and I'm at a place now where if I'm not careful, people might not always feel comfortable checking me. So part of what creating Blackly is for me is having healing space, safe space, and, and making sure the, safe, the space is safe enough that somebody can go, I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. I, th I think yeah. a, a lot of that lends itself to like what trust actually looks like. And there's a, like, like we toss this loaded word trust around a lot, but we don't actually all use the same definition of what trust looks like. Um, and so like I, for myself, like I'm a, I'm a huge uh, reader of Dr. Brene Brown's work on like vulnerability and shame and healing and, and, and trust. And so uh, she, uh, I watched this like talk one time that she gave and she broke down this, uh, what her, and based on her research, what the anatomy of trust was. And she broke it down into an acronym uh, called uh, BRAVING. Uh, and BRAVING uh, breaks down into boundaries, reliability, accountability, vault or confidentiality, integrity, non-judgment, and generosity. And so whenever I'm in any space or any relationship, um, be it personal or professional, 
I'm always using that as uh, part of my compass to be able to determine if I, like, if, am I being held in a space? Am I being safe in a space? Do I have, uh, uh, does the space love me enough to, to listen to me when I tell them the truth, even if that truth is inconvenient. And a lot of times like, you know, walking into, uh, into predominantly white spaces, White people have no clue actually what most black people need and what we think and how we feel about shit. Um, and, and most white people don't have relationships with black people. They work with black people. Um, they share spaces with black people, but they don't actually know black folks because the majority of black folks that, uh, that they share space with share, uh, enter those spaces wearing the mask. So they only know what our masks look like, but they don't actually know us. And so there's a twofold uh, uh, experience to that, right? Um, you have uh, white thought leaders trying to uh, play damage control and virtue signal and you know blame shift and deal with their own internalized shame and then try to like, I have to hurry up and learn what the new buzzword of the week is to prove that I am not quote unquote racist, as opposed to actually creating an environment that fosters trust and, and engenders uh, black folks to come at our fullness. Um, and, then not, and then not to punish or um, strip opportunities away from black folks when we come in at our fullness, because we historically, are the conscience of America, and we are the conscience of uh, of white America as well. Um, it's a big reason why we receive a lot of the venom and vitriol uh, that we do, because America historically does not want to listen to its conscience. And so, uh, to both uh, uh, Gozi and Unfniso's point, like. I think there's not a conversation about like about what trust actually looks like. And so people are like operating from their assumptions or operating from stereotype, you know, in worst case scenarios, and then trying to like to piece things together that aren't actually in service of black folks and, and fostering us to be able to live at the, our full size, but is really more so like, how do I protect myself so that I can so that I can appear to not be whatever thing that like, you know, I don't want, you know, larger society to view me as. And so, and, and that doesn't actually serve us. That more so serves the egos uh, and the sensitivities of predominantly white institutions. So like being able to create uh, institutions for ourselves because we know our needs. Um, we know uh, exactly what, you know, our magic and our mess is and we know what we, uh, we know what we look like at our full size and we welcome that. It, it only makes institutions like MBT that much more valuable um, so that we're able to create work uh, that fully encapsulates the fullness of Blackness. I think it's so interesting and so important what you're saying about trust, Lee, because one of the things that has remained an anchor for me in terms of the way that I'm creating in the rehearsal room and my relationship to these predominantly white institutions and how I'm feeling like there's a safe way and a safe space to work blackly in each of my situations and each of my productions was co obviously control of the narrative that's happening, which right. starts with me as the keeper of the words, but then also my director. And one of the things that has been so integral for me is my relationship with each director that I work with. I cannot work with a director who I do not trust. And I cannot work with a director who I don't feel comfortable being vulnerable with. And I cannot work with a director who I don't feel like the actors are gonna be able to feel comfortable being vulnerable with. To that end, I've never worked with a white director. Not saying that I will not, and not saying that I am against it, but in the place that in the stories that I have told thus far and for the purposes of furthering the black narrative in the way that I needed to tell it so far, the safest and the most anchoring voice for me was to have another black person leading the ship in the space of the director. Because in that rehearsal room is where all of that is being incubated for the, the message of what I'm trying to convey. And there have been so many conversations about 
what's happening with my body in this moment? What's happened to me historically in this moment that I'm saying it this way? Where have I come from? There was a moment in the rehearsal period for, uh, for Gun and Powder when Robert O'Hara was speaking about the history that we were presenting because Gun and Powder is told in the reconstruction era. He said very plainly, our work is this, in terms of the history that we're telling right now, what white people know for black people, slavery, civil rights. In between, we don't know nothing. They don't know nothing about what happened to us. And the truth of that could not have been said by a white person directing the play, nor what I have felt comfortable. I mean, you know what I'm saying? So it's just, it's about for me, the safety of who's in the room with me, who's anchoring me, who's telling, who's guiding the ship with me, and how do I know that this is going to get to the bodies who are ultimately responsible for conveying the story when I go back home for the next however many weeks that it's running. It's about who has set the table. Yeah, I just, I, I think, uh, I think that sort of like my interests are twofold, right? One, I think personally, all like art stuff aside, like Dominique might not believe in safety anymore. Um, I think that like safety might be worth investigating as an idea of anti-blackness and like a fulcrum of anti-blackness, right? Like what does it mean to be safe as a black person when your life can be taken away at any given point, right? Like there are so many ways black people can be murdered, right? Some of them boring, some of them like extravagant, right? So for me, like I think I am trying to find in my own practice is another alternative to safety, something else that is not teaching me how to care for people in the ways that I've been disciplined and forced to think about care, right? Like, because the, the problem with care sometimes is like care is also anti-Black, right? There, the, the care can be a product of anti-Blackness, that the way we hold people cannot be the way that they sometimes need to be held or want to be held to grow as people, right? That's a fulcrum of anti-Blackness, much like, just like I'm saying safety. But I think to your original question, Chelsea, for me, um, the idea of, how did Dr. Tier phrase it? Because it's a long phrase. Um, uh, black, a black cultural art form, a way black of working art, blackly. Right. right, I think a lot about um, one of my favorite theorists, Jared Sexton, right? Sexton argues that any thought, insofar as it is, as, as it is deeply investigated and genuine is black thought, right? I think that I think similar things about black art, right? And like a black cultural art form, that any that any art that is thought through and made in the service of black liberation, of black emancipation, of black freedom, is a black cultural art form, right? Be that writing a play, be that a television show, right? That like the ways and the ways in which God, I read too much. The ways in which that like we are thinking about right, like liberation and emancipation and what that means for us personally, and then also collectively and globally, right, is a black cultural art form that we have been engaging in, much like Marxism since like slavery. Thank you. That, I mean, that's just such an expansive collection of ideas, which I'm like writing down because listen, this is how we're gonna get, this is how we're gonna get to the promised land, okay? Um, so now, la la last week we, I spoke with Ebony Noel Golden and some of the OG liberators who were the founding company members at the National Black Theater who worked very closely with Dr. Tear and in developing the technology of soul. So, you know, they come from a generation where working blackly, they've got, I mean, it's, it's literally down to a science. So they've got, they've got their entry point into that. Um, but something that I think is really fascinating that I realized learning about Dr. Tear is this artist entrepreneurship relationship where you as artists framing yourself as also an entrepreneur, someone who is creating opportunity, someone who is building infrastructure where there wasn't before. Um, and in some of y'all's bios, I can see these, these seeds of um, like with Good Grief and Guzzi, where you start with, you have the concept, you're in control of the narrative, you're, you're, you're bringing together a team of collaborators, you're opening the doors for people to come in and feel welcome, and you're learning the skills to be able to do that consistently. Um, so I wanted to get you everyone's thoughts on what is the importance, is there an importance of being an artist and an entrepreneur? Do you see yourself as invested in those two things? I mean, Dr. Tier. The theater burned down in the 80s and decided she decided to just buy the whole block so that there could be this bedrock of financial autonomy 
for people to have this creative, free creative space. So what are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on art, arts and entrepreneurship? I was actually, I think, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no go ahead. Um, I think as time is going by and as we are now in the time that we are in, that feels like we've always been in this time, but we're locked inside. Um, the more and more the clock is ticking, it feels like though this is something that a lot of us have always been, multi-hyphenates, creators, maker of things, it feels the, the need to, um, I, I don't know how to describe it. I don't know if it's like a land thing or a building thing or a, it, I am feeling the need or the urgency to, to feel like, where do I create a home for myself? I have always in multiple ways felt welcomed in certain spaces. And so Good Grief could not have happened without Lou Moreno letting me into his home that is mostly for Latinx artists. And I, me being a non-Latinx person, right? So, and, 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 you know, first generation project didn't happen unless John Gould Rubin was like, hey, here come, come, I will welcome you into my labyrinth home and, and what have you. And so, you know, a lot of our plays can't happen in, until we're welcome to somebody else's home per se. And so I'm, the more I'm thinking as far as the entrepreneurial spirit, it's like, where do I get the capital, the courage, the chutzpah, the, the whatever to just say, fuck it and create a home for other people. Um, at least for me, I don't know that everybody has to be that or everybody is that, but I will say that the more and more that I am making things, the more and more I'm less interested in having someone let me in their house or even going to someone else's house, you know, um, the more I'm coming into that entrepreneurial spirit and be like, damn, property is not as cheap as it was back when <laughs> Barbara Antier was doing some shit, but but it is making me think about what does, what does my NBT look like? You know, like I'm having those very big thoughts and, and you know, with these we see you letters and these demands and these things, I go, oh, I'm not so interested in someone who sees me or someone seeing me. I see me, I see you, I see all y'all. How do I, how can I be of service to create my own space and maybe it looks like a building maybe it looks like outside I don't know I don't know what it looks like maybe it's in this space but um I think when I think of Barbara Antier the idea of this woman having this foresight that other institutions in New York did not have and I'm thinking of what that looks like now which is all just a big question mark but that's sort of that's where my head is at yeah oh thanks for speaking to that I, I really yeah. have been wondering you know ah, what, what's wrong with me that I'm not so interested in being seen and being welcomed and fighting to get into these spaces? Like, what mm -hmm. is it really going to look like for me to be creating homes for other people? And I feel like personally, this MBT at Home Beats broadcast is, is like me trying to inch into how I could do that and start to play with new mediums and tech to do that. Um, so thank you for speaking to that. Lee, did you, did you want to do did you want to jump in on that? Yeah, like I think that, uh, like I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with my sister. Like, I'm always asking the question: is like, well, be seen by whom? And you know what I mean? Like, like, like that. I feel like that's the important part of the the equation. Um, a, a big for me, I feel like a huge responsibility lies on me to make sure that I'm decentering whiteness. Um, in my work, in my life, you know, decolonizing how I think, you know, and really interrogating which parts of my experience are, my experience and my worldview belong to me as uh, a Black American man who is the descendant of Africans, uh, and which parts are, you know, the parts that I've been socialized to think. And so whom am I prioritizing is really the question that I have to ask myself. And why am I doing that? And if I'm not prioritizing uh, myself, if I'm not prioritizing the people who look like me, if I'm not prioritizing the most marginalized, then there's a lot of self-loathing uh, that I that I accumulate. There's a lot of resentment, you know, that, that that I accumulate, and it really, you know, falls into like codependency, 
uh, at its core, right? And so like, I am, I, if I am frustrated because uh, I'm trying to get to your dinner table and then I get to your dinner table and you don't even know how to cook the food like I like it. And I done done all this work to try to get to your table as opposed to uh, I got food in the fridge. You know, like, so like, I mean, I don't because my food is being delivered, but like, whatever, but like, <laughs> but, but like, but the point is like, I can make things for myself. And there's an incredible, there's a tremendous amount of power uh, that I've found, like, in my just in my own transformation over the last uh, several years in uh, primarily working as an artist and then really bleeding into, you know, operating as a multi-hyphenate and as, uh, a an entrepreneur an artistic entrepreneur and being able to create work opportunities for myself there's a liberating thing that comes uh, that comes with that and i was actually talking with uh uh Gozidi the other day about this about like there's just a freedom of of generosity that we're able to offer when our survival is not tied to uh the work process and we're able to, there's just a, a larger capacity of our hearts that we're able to bring into a space when we're not trying to worry about how, how to survive. And that's definitely, like, there's definitely privilege that comes from that, but, it, but I've also had to find like, okay, so if, uh, if I'm going to stay in this career and, uh, and it's a gig culture kind of career, I have to figure out uh, a means for myself to be able to support myself when things get, when things, when work stops, you know, like, or, or when, and when things fall flat. Um, for me, like, you know, I'm a teaching artist and that is something that I'm deeply passionate about uh, is training and empowering other artists uh, with a priority on black art, black and brown artists. Um, and so that is, you know, for me, that is a way that like, you know, when things were rough, I was able to sustain myself um, uh, while I was in between gigs. Uh, and even now where, when work is abundant for me right now, uh, it's still something that I, that I hunger for and that I prioritize because it keeps my fingers on the pulse of why I started. Um, and it's very easy to forget um, uh, when things are going well, you know, like why it is that you're doing what you're doing and most importantly, whom you're doing it for. And so like, how do we make sure that we zero in on prioritizing our own needs and decentering the needs of, of white folks, you know, like, and, and its presence in our work to make sure that we're really specific about who we're talking to and why. Can I jump in for a second? I, I'm, cause I admit right now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with entrepreneurship. So I just want to like say that out that I'm actually having a, a lot of a struggle and I'm going to like sit in the center of my own hypocrisy for a second and go, I am somebody who likes things. I'm going to buy a leather cat suit and not wear it anywhere. And it's going to sit in my closet with a tag on it. I, I, I'm going to buy the whole drunk elephant skincare line and wonder why I broke out in acne. So like I, I have really confounding um, hypocritical leanings when we talk about what entrepreneurship, which to me is also tied to capital. Amen. So, and the roots of capitalism and the centering of whiteness are inextricably linked. So, and, and, and we haven't, I, I, I mean, I've been sitting on it for a little bit because I also know that this is like a healing, like a, this is a loving space. But if we have conversations about entrepreneurship without having conversations behind propulsion and reason why we're doing what we're doing and it being extraordinarily like rigorous, nuanced, and sometimes narrow, I think, we will then be black people who are not creating blackly, and blackly is a big term anyway. Mm -hmm. 
Mm, Vanessa, well, what do you mean by propulsion? Sorry to interrupt. So I get it. There's a thing of like acquire, acquire, acquire so that I can know that I am worth something and know, know that we have made it. I have made it. And we're not interrogating why I want to acquire that, which might lead to a certain kind of, and this is me fighting in my everyday life within my own work, like a commercial blackness, a watering down of art, a something that is created by black people that is not for black people anymore, but we've mm. got a lot of space. Mm. We've got a lot of buildings. We have a lot of things, just like my cat suit that's in the closet literally right now and not being worn and is kind of so <laughs> I just I just I guess I wish we could add more into that. Like I when I when I create for, for me and you read my bio and there is an entrepreneurship there. That's what I mean when I say I have to stand in the center too of what I am and tell you the way in which I have fi figured this out for myself, I think. And I actually still might be wrong. But like for me, education is at the heart of everything that I do. Mm. And it is why certain buildings erupt around me as opposed to I am building in order to get fame, building in order to get a name, building for notoriety, just kind of parasitically expanding in my building without interrogating why I'm doing it. And so it also means there have been moments where I've had opportunities to create things which I deemed I don't need to create. And I've said no. And Guzzi, <laughs> and Guzzi who has worked with me so much, I hope will like stand testament to sometimes it's like a no. Um, because a wonderful building might erupt from it, but the reason behind it's corrupt. So that's where I'm struggling. I don't actually have an answer, but it is something I interrogate in myself as all of a sudden you do get to a place and it becomes easier and easier to build things and you're like, for what? Mm -hmm. For why? For whom? That's all I got. Yeah, I just mm -hmm. want to say, I, I really resonate with what Infiniso said, right? And like, it, to me, it's always been the difference in building a home and building an empire, right? Mm -hmm. And I think some people start building homes and end up with empires. And mm -hmm. if we, nothing from the history of this failed ass nation, right? That like empires cannot be good things, right? That like an empire requires the colonization and genocide of a people, of multiple people, of numerous people across space and time to exist, right? That there is no good way to build an empire. And the thing that mm. we should be working towards is building a home, right? Home is a very different thing. And I think home can sustain you in a different way, right? I just want a space where like I can be, right? And I mean like just be and not have to worry about anything else, right? Where a place where Dominique can just sit and rest and like the people I love can come to me and I can go to their homes. The, the, uh, the, 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 and I think that this is the thing that the industry does, right? It tricks you into thinking that building an empire is building a house mm -hmm. and the same projects. And one of those projects is inevitably going to kill you in the way that the other one won't, right? You might struggle to get to the home. Having a home will not kill you the way built, having built an empire will, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that, like for me, when I think about entrepreneurship, I, I think about the, the, the sort of necessity of its abolition, right? That like we need, there, there has to be a way to do away with the way we think about entrepreneurship. Because at the end of the day, to me at least, like black capitalism doesn't save black people, right? Mm -hmm. Like there must be another way to rethink this thing. Um, I think like black communism may be the answer. Who knows? <laughs> what I do think is really important, just riding in on it, is also just the interrogation of what it means to say that word, entrepreneurship, in relation to what it is we're doing, is really, really important. Because for me, when the terms get 
that big, that broad, they become really um, easy to put things on without mm -hmm. knowing anymore what it is. Oh, this is just so, I mean, just all the notes, all, all the notes. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna quickly pivot to Facebook Live questions, see what folks are asking, asking on, the, on the chat. Um, and then I have like one question before we round out our time here that I just wanna plant right now and then we'll circle back to it. But the, the question has to do with 50 years from now, what kind of institutions, homes, do you want to see? Okay, I'm just gonna put that out there. Let me go find these uh, Facebook Live questions. Um, 50 okay, years. fifty, another fifty, another fifty. Um, okay, someone's got a someone's got a um, a therapist contact for you. <laughs> Can we put that in the group chat? Can I get the therapist that. contact too? I'm <laughs> saying. Dr. Dr. Cynthia Barnes. Dr. Cynthia Barnes. Is that who, with a C um, or with the however you else you spell Cynthia? I don't know. Let me put that. Let me put her in the uh, chat here. This is creative. I don't know. You Cynthia know. Barnes. We got her number S here. Y N T H. That's that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Not saying like Cincinnati. Thank yeah. you. Okay, so that's what that's what somebody had for you there. Good looking so gifts. <laughs> Good looking out. Um and uh, okay, this this last question, I'm not really sure how to frame it, but it's someone's asking about like what and this might be an interesting question because now we're, you know, this is DQ or during quarantine and we don't know when we're going to be. America has been disinvited to a lot of other countries. So mm -hmm. um, this is a tricky question, but someone's asking about the mask. And I think Lee spoke about this earlier, the mask that people present, that Black folk present in certain areas, in certain um, rooms. This person wants to know about working globally you know, how, working internationally, how do you do this dance with representing who you are, you know? So yeah, I, I'm not really sure what the question is in that, but if, if anyone wants to speak to maybe working what's internationally, huh, what's the comment? Yeah. So here's what, here's what we got. Someone says, do you believe you need to wear a mask even when you are in dominantly white environments? predominantly white environments outside of the U.S. All the same. Yeah, like a mask is a mask is a mask. Oh, no, it's just, it's like anti-blackness global. Oh, right. All mm -hmm. white, white people saying, right? Like, and I don't, I don't know if that necessitates, I think the mask conversation is an interesting one, like that Du Bois was trying to figure out. Um, and I think that like, to Lee's point earlier, right? It is a process of like, maybe understanding that the mask needs to be undone right that like you should just be able to be the the person that you are right that like the idea of like a permanent self right the dominique that is up at 3 a.m playing with the cat is the same dominique that's directing plays right there is no there is no split between them right like that you should just be able to be the same person at all times and show up as fully as you can um even in the face of like rigorous and profound acts of anti-blackness it's yeah. this anti-compartmentalization that, um, Panisa, you were talking about in relation to bell hooks, which I think is like, yeah, let's like take all the screens off and just be able to be here. Um, Lee, were you hopping in? Yeah, I was gonna say, I actually think we have a responsibility uh, to take off, to, to decompartmentalize uh, in space. Um, because it, one, it's like, you know, it's that, that uh, proverb about like, you know, when you shine your light, you empower other people to shine theirs. Um, I, I feel it, if we are trying to get back to the fullness of ourselves and the softest version of ourselves, then to, we owe it, we owe a debt to ourselves to make sure that we make up for, lo for the lost time, like for that 12 year old or 15 year old or, or 21 year old kid in me who was afraid to be the full size of myself, I actually owe him uh, back pay in my fullness. And so that like, 
I make sure that I enter every space the same dude. Um, like what you see is, is, is what you get. And there's a lot of that comes from like our own socialization of being gaslit, right? To, and, and how we express and talk about our pain. So we have been socialized to think that if I name my pain uh, in public space or in this idea of mixed company, um, that there's somehow that there's something wrong with that. Like we 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 all know the stereotypes of like you know the angry black man and the angry black woman. Um, but then I I'm I push back against that. I'm like yes, I, but I actually should be angry because anger is a healthy response to oppression. Why aren't you angry too? You know, like, so, or why aren't you, uh, uh, I don't do you any service by wearing the mask because then I socialize you into thinking that this is the full size of black people and it's not. And so uh, it is my responsibility to make sure that I am as unapologetically myself um, as I can be, I am as, equally unapologetically and equally compassionately myself uh, as I can be and, and, and how I move through space. So with, uh, and I find this, like this is a, a, a thing that I take on with like uh, younger black artists, um, you know, like I'm always like, you know, you know, challenging like, you know, like my younger black brothers and sisters to be like, actually, you don't, you do yourself a disservice by shrinking. Um, you don't like when, you know, if you pull me aside to talk about how you're being hurt in a white space, you don't have to hush your voice when you talk about white people. You actually can say that with your chest, you know, and you get to name like how you are hurt. And I think, and I forget, um, oh, this is going to kill me. Like, uh, I don't remember if it was Toni Morrison uh, uh, or Zora Neale Hurston, um, but it was like, if you don't speak up about the ways in which people hurt you, they will eat you and say that you enjoyed it because you never complained. And so like, I don't want to be eaten. That, that is just not a desire for me in any space. So if something is, is causing me harm, I feel like it's my responsibility to not only uh, speak it, but to speak it full-throatedly and, ins and insist on you know, whatever that repair or reparations or whatever it is with just as much full throat and passion. I agree. And I feel like what happens is there's two planes to that, right? Like there's the personal plane when you walk into the space and then they have a perception about you because of the way you look and the way they expect you to sound and the way that they expect you to represent yourself. And you have to be diametrically opposed to that personally. But then also one of the things that happens to us as creatives, we have these two halves. We have the halves of us that are birthing the children that are inside of our own wombs. And then the halves of us that are being paid or asked to come in and help other people birth their children. And when you're in that writer for hire, director for hire, creative for hire situation, and you're being presented with an idea and a representation of blackness that is inaccurate, you have to radically challenge it and you have to speak very, very clearly about why it's wrong and not just try to, because a lot of times when we talk about having a seat at the table, having access, being invited, being seen, being asked, being hired, being paid, then we start to do that shrinking to say like, I have to protect my survival. I have to protect my source of income, all these different things. And that disservices the entire narrative. And if you don't come forth and say, I'm not taking this project because it's doing X and it's this is inaccurate. Then you have not done the service of not only the mass, but like you have then poisoned yourself and the rest of us because now you're allowing this thing to go out and live. And so like, we also have to be gatekeepers and not just taking off our masks. Um, I completely agree with everything everybody has just said. And I also know that in my life, like internationally, I've always worn the mask um, in terms of like uh, maybe say European internationals. But interestingly, what's coming up for me is I've also worn the mask when I was in Nigeria, surrounded mm -hmm. by people who are all my own and, and had to put on a mask like I was straight as opposed to being the queer woman that I am. So it's been also where I am in life. It is 
it is it is glaringly apparent to me when I'm wearing that mask with white folk. And I am now working on where and how I am ever so slightly compartmentalizing and masking with my own and finding that to be um, difficult, troubling because of how much love I have, but also um, really kind of dedicating my life as much as I can. And it's slow steps, it's early slow steps, but going, I'm not gonna compartmentalize anywhere for my health. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I feel like we lose a part of ourselves. Like, I mean, like we're, it's like, uh, so like we're being asked to amputate parts of ourselves when we do that, you know? And, the, and then, you know, expect it to smile, you know? Like, and I mean, it's only in the last several years that I've been, you know, like I've, I gave myself the personal challenge to like to live in both my blackness and my queerness with the volume on 150, you know? And, uh, you know, and also like, you know, my, uh, my intellect and my hoodness and that, you know, intersection and like where all of that lives, my Philly and uh, my academic, you know, like all of these things, you know, like, uh, my magic and my mess, you know, it is the full size of who I am. And it's my responsibility to like, to, to know my intersections, you know, know which lanes are mine, know where I can park. And if there's a meter, make sure I pay my tax. So like, I, that is my responsibility and my responsibility alone. Um, so that I, I can make sure that I'm not swerving into nobody else's lane, that I don't allow anybody to swerve into mine. Um, that, you know, like, it's, you know, as long as somebody uses a blinker, you know, like, you know, come on in. And I mean, like, all of these things are, uh, are important. Um, somebody's knocking on my door, so I have to go get that for a second. So I will be right back. But, um, but you know, I, I completely agree with you, Infinito, and thank you for that. Be right back. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. All right, we are coming to a little bit before the end of our time. We've got about four minutes here. Um, and so, this is this question has now turned into a theater game, which is in a word or two, can you describe an institution or a home or a a radically free space, sustained radically free space that you would like to see established in the next fifty years? Uh, I don't know who wants to start us off. <laughs> The word that keeps coming to me is provision. Mm. Provision yes. on all on all sides. Got you. Got you. All right. Maybe I should should I just call people's names so that we have to like <laughs> so just put it out there. Okay, Dominique, I'm gonna go with you next. Yeah, can I actually not answer this question and answer the first, the, the, the question you asked about institutions in 50 years? Awesome, final questions, here we go. Yeah, I, for me in 50 years, I hope that there are no institutions, right? I, I am dreaming of a future wherein the idea of institutions and the soil that has been so deeply corroded by anti-Blackness no longer exists, right? So that when we come out on the other side, when like Black liberation as a project has happened, there won't be words to describe the new things we are going to be able to create. I don't have the language to describe it yet, right? But I know that currently institutions are insufficient, right? That inst institutions cannot do the work that I need and that people need, right? And so for me, I am dreaming of a world without them so we can get on to the business of making something better. Mm. I'm with it, hundred percent. And Kazi, what do you think? Fifty years from now, um, a place that welcomes people to radically expand. That's the 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 place that I dream of. A place where someone can expand and go through the messy and difficult business of growth, and be welcome to do that. Love it, Lee. The question was fifty years from now. What do you want to see um, be established in the world? And we're thinking institutions, homes, we're thinking the complete explosion of the idea of needing institutions. 
Um, so yeah, that's that's the that's the question. In one to two words, can you sum up what you would like to see established in the next fifty years? Um, but before I'll give you a second to think, Lee and Infiniso, what do you want to see fifty years from now? I would love to see pluralistic blackness within a home, where you have. I mean, I have dreams of Africa and her diasporas kikiing it up. And like maybe before there's a theater show, there is actually Erikani Kong soup and then there's some gumbo and then there are foods that I should know that I don't know that were derivative of the foods that we did have. And that like, we've like, we returned and we remembered the way we used to actually do our play in our old archival and that like somehow we are sitting all together within a theater and celebrating all the ways blackness has morphed and become wide and expansive and we are strong enough as a community to hold on the iteration of what that could look like and be confounding as it could be as well. That's what I like. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love that there's like no, what are the words to describe this that is coming? We don't, we don't even have the words for it yet. And that's, I mean, that's amazing because it'll be a hybrid of amazing, wonderful things. Lee, rounding us off here, <clears throat> 50 years from now. Um, I would like to see a space that has a larger capacity for radical healing um, and for trust. You know, like, like for, for us to really prioritize trust and for that uh, to be prioritized across culture. Um, I want to see in 50 years, I wanna see black folks love each other radically. Mm. And I wanna see other institutions uh, love black people radically too. I wanna see other cultures love black people radically. I like, I want us to to find what that love letter looks like um, and how to put that into practice. Um, I want us to find, you know, and, and then respect boundaries and reliability and accountability and vault and integrity and non-judgment and generosity. And for those to be the, the starting place for our conversations. Um, yeah, I want, I want spaces where we, where we don't have to flinch and where we don't have to shrink and where we, where we can say things full-throated and with our chest and the full size of our hearts cracked open, you know? Like that's, at least that, that's what I'm working toward. Uh, and that's what, that's how I plan to leave every space black than when I found it. So that every space that I'm in is a black space, you know, even if it's, you know, even if it's just me sometimes, it just means I, I gotta dial up the, you know, and be extra black since there ain't nobody in my space. Um, but yeah, I want I want to I want to be in spaces where I'm not a minority ever. Just was writing that last one down. Leave the space blacker than I found it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm here for it. Quote to Lee's beautiful yes. monologue there. Um, one of my favorite writers, Sadia Hartman, has this quote that she gave in an Instagram live, where she reminds us that. Um, Revolutionary love will, will defeat anti-Black violence. And then she poses the question to Lee's, to Lee's notion of like Black love, right? What does it mean to love that which was never intended to be loved? Um, mm. And I think that's very powerful about that. Mm. And Sadia Hartman wrote this book that has been blowing is that my mind. Or is it Wayward Lives? Wayward Lives? This is Wayward Lives. She this is Wayward yeah. Lives Beautiful Experiment. And I yes. she snapped. Sadia Hartman is my ace friend and my cousin, oh, what? and I love her. So hearing y'all quote her makes me so happy. I don't usually mm -hmm. name drop, but that's my heartbeat. <laughs> you should have started this panel with that, <laughs> <laughs> that, that. That woman is like, I'm gonna mute myself now because I've done too much. <laughs> Oh my goodness, just blessings and gifts. <laughs> oh, come on now. 
Well, this has been uh, just, it's been so, it's been, I, I woke up this morning and I was feeling just this, I couldn't quite put the finger to what it, what it was, but this anxiety, <sighs> this kind of restlessness, this like uh, feeling kind of overwhelmed and, and going back to your question and Guzzi, who is this for? Why, why am I doing this? Why am I, you know, bringing myself to this, to my, to my kitchen every Thursday. Um, and this is a, a good reminder of, of why. So thank you for creating this radically free and loving space for me to lay that, lay that down. Didn't know how heavy it was. Um, Chelsea, can, so, I add, can I add something before, before we wrap? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something that just occurred to me that I feel, that I also feel is important to say too, about like one of the things that I'm hungry for in 50 years, mm -hmm. um, a lot of there's been a lot of conversation uh, about um, decentering whiteness, right? Uh, and all of those kind of, like all the conversations around that. But the other part of our healing too lies at the feet at, at us black men, um, mm -hmm. so that we can be better for you for for y'all as black women, um, and by extension like black queer bodies as well. Uh, there is. I mean, like I've seen things like, you know, in the last couple of weeks and also just in the, like in just in life um, where we are often agents of harm. Um, and one of the things that I am hungry for in the next 50 years is for us as black men to get aggressive and radically repair ourselves so that we can be better for black women. And, uh, and that we don't shrink away from the discomfort that comes from account, like true accountability and the vulnerability that comes from taking off our armor and being able to hold space for ourselves where we can say, well, like, yes, we are, you know, there are things that we are victim to in the world, uh, i.e. racism, but here's also where we are agents of harm as well. And like, we aren't, we're responsible for our half. Um, so that's something that like, something that I am personally hungry for um, and also like spaces for us as black men where we can come together and heal. Um, and so that we're not, you know, the ones who uh, uh, leaving scars and not imprints, you know? Mm. Um, so, that, so that was something that like, before we left, I wanted to make sure that that was, uh, uh, that that was said. I really think that there's a radical uh, revolution that has to happen specifically with uh with us as black men thank you thank you for, couldn't, couldn't have said it better myself really appreciate that um final thoughts anyone i got love for y'all oh good i got love for deep love. those are my thoughts love <laughs> accountability growth amen being present Staying in the moment. Most of y'all got my number. You know what it is. <laughs> Call me, Marco Polo. Polo me. I miss y'all. Dominique, if you want to, if you want to get in on that. Listen, we can find me on the Marco Polo. Okay. <laughs> I'm saying. <laughs> y'all been talking about oxtails, and Fanisa talked about gumbo. I'm like, can we have a dinner? Oh, oh my. <laughs> Y'all got to be hungry over here. Can we cook something and like email some recipes and <laughs> get a Google Doc going? Come on. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. I can't wait to gather with you guys. A black playwright recipe book. That's what we need. Yes. yes. Delicious. Mm -hmm. Absolutely mm -hmm. delicious. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you all for joining us here for NBC at Home Founders Month edition. Um, hit that donate button for the Vision <laughs> Forward Fund if you've got it. And if you want to share what we're doing here, please, this is free and open to everyone. So um, please come on in. This is your home as well. So I will see you next week. Thank you to everyone who is here. Um, artists, please stick around. We're gonna, we can hang out in the green room and chat some more about this <laughs> playwright recipe, <laughs> recipe book. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I'll catch you all on the flip side. See you next week.